Okay, good afternoon. I'm calling the regular monthly meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission to order for Wednesday, January 22nd, 2014. Will you all rise for the pledge, please? Ready to pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you all. Ms. McGill, would you call roll, please? Chair Wiscombe? Here. Case Bear? Here. Ferrara? Here. Heaton? Here. Longstreet? Here. Uribe? Here. Intern Rodriguez? Here. Great, thank you, Ms. McGill. And uh, introduction of the new commissioner. So did you want to say something, Ms. Rapp? Or, okay. Okay. We are pleased to have um, two new commissioners. Uh, you got that? Okay. <laughs> We're pleased to welcome two new commissioners to the Parks and Recreation Commission, uh, Olivia Uribe and Jim Heaton. And we welcome you both. Um, would either of you like to say anything or any you don't have to. You can. <laughs> well, just thank you. Thank you for the welcome and looking forward to working with the commissioners and the, and the community. Great. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here and thank you to the council for the appointment. And I can't wait to get to working and learning. Great. Well, we're looking forward to working with you. And I'd also like to thank Mr. Ferrara and Mr. K. Spear for rejoining us, for re-upping for another four years. So that's great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, changes to the agenda? Ms. Rapp? Uh, Chair Wiscombe, uh, I think we'll review as uh, we make our way through the agenda, but the recommendation would be to take um, item number five before item number four, but um, if you can make that decision at the end of item three. Um, Great. But that I, is what I think we would do. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and written communications, Ms. Rapp? Chair Wiscom and commissioners, um, we did uh, forward to you via email and gave you a paper copy, and we will include a, um, a copy of it in your um, packet for the following month since it is official written communication. But I did want to share it with you. It is a memo from Mark Sherman to the commission. Um, Mark Sherman you may remember, has made several presentations to the commission related to the work that he was doing with the neighborhood and outreach services staff to develop our community kitchen program. And unfortunately, um, the grant funding for his position did end, and we were not successful with getting the funding for the coming year. However, with his help and the work that he has done, we are hoping to resubmit and have funding in the future. Um, Mark ex wrote a very nice memo expressing his appreciation uh, to the commission and for staff for his experience. We certainly share his feelings. He, he gave us a tremendous gift during his time with our department, and we look forward to continuing the relationship. Great, thank you very much. Um, and we certainly wish him well and we're gonna miss him. He's, he was a great asset, definitely. Um, okay, we're moving on to public comment. Uh, is anyone here to comment on an item that's not on the agenda? Okay, seeing that there's no one, I'm going to close public comment and we will move on to the Youth Council report. Mr. Rodriguez, yeah, thanks, welcome. Madam Chair. Um, at our last meeting, we actually welcomed four new members, uh, which feel, filled the alternative private and Santa Barbara High School um, uh, spots. So I think all we have left is another Santa Barbara DP, but we'll have to wait until the next uh, term to reelect. Um, youth. Uh, an event that's coming up is the Youth Council is hosting its second annual Youth Leadership Conference, which is uh, a pretty big event for us. Um, there will be leaders from different organizations 
uh, speaking for us and AS ASB officers. Um, and we decided at our last meeting, uh, the date will be April 11th. Um, we do not know what time yet, but uh, I'll have more information at the next meeting. Um, the youth council was also approached and asked to co-sponsor a youth leadership work workshop this weekend, January 25th, uh, with Pacif Pacific Pride Foundation. Uh, youth council will do a presentation on what makes a youth a leader. Um, our presentation is at 2 p.m. at the Lowry Davis Center. Um, anyone's invited, and it be all, the whole thing begins at 9 a.m. Uh, lastly, we participated in the MLK uh, Junior Parade and Celebration this past Monday. Um, the Youth Council has participated in this the past six years, and uh, this year we had a lot of fun. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Been busy. Good luck coming up. That's really great to hear. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to uh, Commissioner Committee assignment reports, and we'll start with Ms. Longstreet. Uh, this month, I attended the Neighborhood Advisory Council meeting where the one-time monies were discussed, and uh, the council was asked for a recommendation. It was a long meeting. It was difficult. Um, they did come up, uh, vote to support the staff recommendation on the projects for the one-time monies. And the main concern is that uh, lighting still stay a priority and that there be monies for a lighting study in the future. So they're looking at both the east and the west side for better lighting. And I also uh, attended the Park Foundation meeting. And just a, we are planning our fundraiser for April. And so look for more information on that coming up. Ms. Wiscombe is going to chair that committee again and we're very grateful for that the other thing I just briefly um, for our new commissioners the Park Foundation is a, a private nonprofit that a couple of the commissioners sit on and it's uh, gives us the ability to support um, grassroots organizations that raise a little money that to do activities in the community so we hold monies for um, groups that aren't quite big enough to be a nonprofit maybe um, a friends of uh, a good example is the East Beach friends of East Beach are redoing the volleyball courts and we hold the money for them and um, allow them to be a 501 use our 501c3 for that so it's to support parks and recreation activities in our community and um, for the general public, you can look at our website, and we're always open for donations. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Ferrara, you have... Yes, thank you, Chair Wiscom. Um, two meetings. Uh, there was the uh, Creeks Advisory Committee. They canceled their regular meeting, but on that same day, they took uh, went to examine the upper uh, Royal Borough Watershed Restoration Site, which was recently purchased by the city. And uh, yesterday there was a special IPM meeting where it was uh, different methods were discussed on how to clear uh, plant roots from the city uh, sewer lines. And that was yesterday. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Casebeer. Yes. Um, Andrew Rodriguez covered the Youth Council, and I did attend the Arts and Crafts uh, meeting this last week. And they're very excited about the new city website and how th they can help attract more visitors to the Sunday Arts and Crafts Fair. And they're also looking forward to working with the new marketing director, Sumner, Summers Case. And she is in the audience this evening. And thank you for coming aboard, Summers. And the other item that um, we spent a good deal of time on is the Cabrillo Bridge replacement. This is um, an item that's been floating around for years. And uh, recently the city worked out um, some kind of a, a deal with the pizza parlor across the street. So now they're going forward with that bridge replacement, though nothing moves quickly. It won't um, 
start until um, summer of 2015, and it'll take about 18 months or two years to complete. So that's my report. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. K. Spear. And I'd like to welcome um, Council Member Greg Hart to Nice to See You, and thank you for coming. Very nice to see you. <laughs> okay. Um, and let's see. What uh, I attended the uh, Golf Advisory Committee meeting, um, and I'm happy to report that revenues improved in October, November, and December, but costs are uh, also higher, and obviously water is a big concern uh, with the golf course. So um, we're watching that very closely. Uh, the director of golf, um, Chris Tellerico, uh, gave us a really excellent report on, on youth golf activities at, at the course. And I'm really pleased to say there's been remarkable increases in all the youth programs at the golf course. Um, in some cases, 50 to 80 percent over a three-year period from 2010 to 2013. So the programs are really coming along very nicely, and it's nice to see um, participation increasing so smartly. Uh, and um, revenues are up for other special programs. Uh, Mr. Tellerico mentioned those, like the Nine and Dine program, uh, Lesson Pro packages, and the GNO, Girls' Night Out program at the golf course. So it, it's all in all, it was it was um, it's it's nice to see things going well. Um, on the ninth. Of January, I attended the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting where I heard reports on both the Library Plaza and the Urban Forest Management Plan, both of which are on your agenda uh, tonight. And Ms. Longstreet mentioned um, the Park Foundation meeting. It's for those of you that don't know, it's P A R C, not P A R K. So just just so you know that. And we preliminarily have our right now have our fundraiser. We're going to keep our fingers crossed that we can get our urban wine trail participants back. But we uh, have a tentative date of Sunday, April 27th. So if you could put a light circle on your calendar for that, and it will be something like magic on the urban wine trail two because it's just the same thing we um, we did last year except hopefully bigger and better so we're really working hard to make that happen and raise some money uh, for our valuable youth programs so that's my report and uh, commission and staff communications Ms. Rapp Madam Chair and Commissioners, I have a, a few items that I'd just like to bring to your attention, but I'd like to start out um, by letting you know that I've invited Mike Nelson, who is the new Executive Director of the Ealings Park Foundation. Ealings Park is on city park land, and they have a long-term lease with the city. The park is operated without any government funds or support. It's strictly based on user fees and funds that the board generates to support park operations. Um, very pleased to have Mike come in as the new executive director. He brings unique experiences to the Ealings Park leadership. He has experience working for state park organizations and foundations and natural resources management. So he has a breadth of experience that will very much benefit both Ealings and the city as we move forward. With that, I would like to ask Mike to come up and introduce to you Mike Nelson. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a long background in parks and open space areas, but the urban park that is Ealings Park is really going to be a great challenge. Um, one of the resources that I hope that I can rely on is the city of Santa Barbara, our partner. And at Ealings, the city of Santa Barbara and the park were planned together with a joint development committee some, you know, back in, 19, in the 60s is when it began. And as we move forward, uh, I am certain we will be in front of you with projects, and I am hoping that one of the requirements of their lease, of our lease with you, our two leases with you, is a report 
to the city council and uh, it's not due till the end of the fiscal year, but I would like to take the opportunity perhaps to preview it with the Parks and Rec Commission before we send it formally to the city council as a, just a matter, a routine matter, because we would very much like to have the benefit of your views on what we're doing right there and what you think we may be doing wrong there. Uh, because we're going to have a number of projects that will be before you. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, if there's a question that I might answer while I'm standing here, I'm happy to do that. Does anyone have a question? No, I, I will say, I, as I told Mike uh, before the meeting, when he applied to the Parks and Recreation Commission, I was very excited about his background and then... Uh, you're um, asking for our input. Uh, that's that's really very great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Longstreet. Uh, uh, Mr. Nelson, the one thing that always comes to mind for me that we, we seem to forget is in all the rows and things that go back and forth is how important Ealings is for the west side of Santa Barbara. Okay. We have no park space, per se, over on the west side. And I think we need to really promote Ealings as part neighborhood park. It is a regional park, but it is also part neighborhood park. And, you know, I think that's something sometimes in all the hoopla that happens, we forget. But it is accessible to many, many residents on the west side. So thank you for... No, no, that's, that's great. And uh, whatever we can, I can do to work with you to make that happen, I'm, I'm glad to do it because... You know, we, uh, it's a 230-acre area, but it sits just above the Douglas Preserve and connects to Hendry's Beach. It's a marvelous complex, open space complex there. So, thanks. Thank you. Great place to take your dog, too. I speak from personal experience. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, and thanks for joining us, Mr. Nelson. Uh, so it, yes. The next informational item, uh, and uh, Commissioner Longstreet, I think you mentioned it uh, in your comments, but I do want to, and I provided to the commission a copy of the agenda for the city special city council meeting on Monday evening at 5 p.m. Um, to discuss funding recommendations for over $4.3 million of funding, one-time monies available for capital projects. Um, that meeting has been moved to city council chambers here. So some people have the uh, previous agenda, which says Chase Palm Park Center, but it has been moved because we are expecting more people to be here. Um, the, the city council has received um, in their staff report, uh, I think there's 16 different projects totaling over $8 million dollars. Parks and Recreation has two specific projects that will be considered. One is the final funding that's necessary to do the renovation of Cabrillo Ballfield that we've been working towards over the last couple of years in which the commission has had a public meeting to hear interest from the community to add new recreation activities to that area as well as make improvements to the park. And that project is recommended for $455,000 of funding and also a contribution to move the Kids World renovation forward. And that's um, proposed at $250,000. So um, with over $8 million in projects and $4.3 million in funds available at this time, um, we are, um, if, if commissioners can be present to speak to the priorities for community parks and recreation, that would be appreciated. Uh, so I wanted you to have the full packet with the descriptions of the projects. And Ms. Longstreet mentioned the recommendations from the Neighborhood Advisory Committee and their concerns. There are a number of um, pedestrian and lights and other improvements um, that have been mentioned in different neighborhoods that are also being considered. Great, thank you. Mr. Farrer, did you have a question? What a difference from four years ago. 
<laughs> yes. And this, you know, we are just starting to have the conversations about FY15 budget for capital. So we'll have some additional funds um, that we'll be bringing some funding recommendations back to the commission. Um, and that leads me to the uh, third item, which I just wanted to make you aware of, is that we are actually starting to work on our budget recommendation that will go to the city administrator. This is year two of a two-year budget, um, but certainly we are looking at our revenues and looking to see what we'll expect um, for FY15. It's, it's been a year since we developed that budget, so we'll be revisiting that and revisiting our priorities um, and then coming to the commission um, in the next couple of months. Also, the drought and the dry conditions are an increasing concern for the Parks and Recreation Department, both from a parks perspective and also the golf course. We are projecting that we will exceed our water budgets, um, just trying to maintain and conserve our resources. The commission will be hearing more about this um, as we move forward. We are starting both within the parks division and the golf course to prioritize areas that should have uh, more attention and water resources over others as we go forward. Um, we are always very conservative in maximizing our water through our irrigation systems, but we will be having um, serious discussions and planning for how we'll reduce that um, as the community responds to the continued dry conditions. And the last thing that I wanted to let you know, because we came and involved the commission in a report, I think it was back in August, uh, or maybe it was actually July, on the skate park. And we told you that we'd been working with um, a group of people from the community, stakeholders related to the skate park. And so we are continuing to do that. In fact, they're going to be having a meeting on uh, Monday evening. So. We, as part of this, expect to come back to the Commission with a number of um, ideas, concepts for you to hear and discuss and provide further input. So uh, we are continuing to monitor that facility and, um, and look at what our options are. And that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Mr. Casebeer. <laughs> Ms. Rapp, um, in the future, I'm quite sure you'll be making a report on the water drought situation. And just out of cure, if you can include, we use recycled water. Yes, we do. In many of the parks and golf courses and how we're maximizing that. And uh, I would say the majority of our water is recycled water. So potable water is at the golf course used primarily for the areas where you would expect people to interact with water, restroom facilities, drinking fountain, restaurant, et cetera, um, and for our greens, and then recycled water in all of the other areas. So, uh, and the same is true in parks. So recycled water is, is a big component of how we use water currently. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that uh, report. Uh, we're going to move on to agenda item number one, which is uh, approval of the minutes from the meeting on Wednesday, December 18th, 2013. Does anyone have any changes to those minutes? I'll make a motion. We approve the minutes of December 18th, 2013. I'll second. Okay, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? Abstention. Are you? Did I wasn't present. Oh, okay. Three. So, well, we're actually. I think. I think you can actually. Yeah. Okay. You. You yes, should actually. I yeah. Yeah. And and just for future reference, you can approve minutes of meetings even if you're not here. But in this case, you weren't on the commission, so I think you're, you did the appropriate thing. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to uh, agenda item number two, which is the draft concept design for library plaza improvement project. And 
we welcome Director Irene Macias to uh, table Chair, and yeah. Chair mm -hmm. Wiscom and Commissioners. This is the second time that this concept plan is back before the Commission. And uh, Library Director Irene Macias will introduce the project and the uh, staff and resource people that she has with her for that. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Wiscom, members of the Commission. As Nancy said, I'm Irene Macias. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, uh, members of the team that are here today. First of all, Scott Love, um, over on the end, is Library Services Manager, and he is responsible for operations at the Central Library. So he has a, a very intimate knowledge of the Library Plaza. Um, we also have um, Mark Aguilar. Mark was uh, with the Redevelopment Agency and was the project manager when the um, when this was under the redevelopment agency, uh, provided some very good guidance. And um, he's come back to us recently in more of a support role um, and, uh, and advisory, and he has been invaluable, so thank you, Mark. Um, and also, Trish Allen is here. She is from the Museum of Arts um, team, and we've been working closely with the museum. So glad to see she's here. Um, and lastly, uh, Doug and Regula Campbell, who are our consultants and have provided a, a wonderful design. We've been working um, for a while on this. Um, and a little bit of background, uh, we did uh, have approval for this, for the design of the project in 2010, um, hired um, Campbell and Campbell in May of, March or May of 2011, um, and quickly began work on the project. Um, and then um, we were able to go before the Street Tree Advisory Committee in November of 2011, followed by our visit here for review and comments. And at the end of November, we went to HLC and uh, received feedback from them. We went back and started working on some changes, and um, then the project was put on hold because of the dissolution of the redevelopment agency. Um, and another um, event that uh, impacted the project during that time was an action taken by the City Council um, in November of 2012, and that was a uh, landmarking of five eucalyptus trees on the property, three um, on the north side, north entrance, and two at the south entrance. Um, and in the meantime, um, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art um, let us know that they were embarking on uh, a museum renovation project. And um, we realized and recognized that we had many um, things in common, uh, including our space, but many goals and needs. And so we decided to work together and collaborate and try to come up with a good design that really reflected our needs um, and desires, and um, also that something that would be the best plan for the community. Um, and so, uh, so we have uh, worked together since June. We actually expanded the scope of the project to include the entire um, library parcel. So um, we put Doug and Regula to work on more design um, with a real focus on accessibility because that was something that we heard a lot. Um, even though the original plan, the original project um, didn't include that back part of the library as its scope, we did get lots of comments on that. So, um, so the design that you'll see today um, incorporates many of the desires and needs of the museum and is something that we're very excited about um, and want to share. Um, and Regula Campbell will be doing the presentation. Ready? Yeah. Here, you can give you the mouse. Okay. Well, let me use this. I think it's easier. All right. Um, I'll take you through the steps we went through on the design, starting in 2011 with the original project. And you can see the scope of work here in the shaded portion 
of the uh, drawing so that it's this area here. Here's the li Central Library. This is the Faulkner Gallery, the Museum of Art here, La Arcada down here on the southwest, and the library parking structure, Anna Kappa Street and Anna Pamu Street. So it was primarily this area in front of, or, or the, the front of the main entrance, the north entrance to the library and the Faulkner, and between the library and the Museum of Art and Anna Pamu Street. Um, here you can see an aerial kind of shot from the Granada building towards the project site. You see the two prominent coast live oaks right there along the side, along Anna Pamu. Uh, this was taken, obviously, in the wintertime, and you see the deciduous pears um, as street trees along the front of the historic library. And this is really an important project. Uh, we've had a lot of public input. This is the center, really, of the Cultural Arts District of Santa Barbara, and also very important for the Commercial District and Governmental District. So we have two landmark buildings on the site. One is the Historic Public Library, which was originally designed and built in 1917. As you see, it was damaged during the 1925 earthquake and was remodeled by Carlton Winslow, also a notable architect, who uh, donated this entablature over the main doors to the Historic Library, which are no longer an entry to the library. They are fire doors only, fire exiting only. Um, and this is in the Spanish Renaissance style, revival. Um, and the other uh, landmark building is the Faulkner Gallery. And you can see in the two top uh, photos, uh, shortly after it was built and completed, um, that it is in the zigzag modern uh, style with an Egyptian motif to it. You can see it looks like very much like an Egyptian tomb front as a building against the sky. And you see it had this long uh, reflecting pool in front of it. Um, in the lower slides, you can see the landscape that was installed in the 1970s and how the building is really obscured from Annapamu Street. So the project description for this original project was, as you see here, to create a safe, inviting main entrance to the Library and Faulkner Gallery and a public gathering space for the Library and Faulkner Gallery events and other activities. So there's a lot of programming that goes on with the library itself, book signings, children's readings, lots of events. And of course, the Faulkner is a great uh, community resource with gallery shows, but also a whole range of activities um, that go on there throughout the year. So to address such an important public project, um, Doug and I have uh, used a process that, of public participation workshops where we, are, these are hands-on participatory workshops where people of the community, we open it to anyone who's interested to come and help us work out the goals and the guidelines for the project. It's a wonderful resource. It allows people who wouldn't ordinarily be able to work with designers to set the goals for the project and to really get their hands in there. And, and it reveals a lot of information to us about people who have experienced life experiences here in the area uh, and, and know a lot about the space. So we start out with uh, a little individual workbooks. We go out and look at the site and there's a number of scenarios in these workbooks such as um, you're taking your uh, friend who's in a wheelchair, you've parked at the library parking garage, how do you get into the library for a book signing in the afternoon? So we take people through, or, or you're a um, kindergarten teacher and you've brought your students for a book reading at the library, where do you sit and have lunch and do you feel safe and comfortable, et cetera? Then we reconvene um, at tables with site plans of the project site. People record their observ observations and uh, look for opportunities and problems with the site. They record them and talk together and start to put down their ideas for the design of the project. Um, at the end of the day, each table uh, nominates somebody to get up and give a presentation as to what their table has uh, concluded, the consensus points, but also points of contention. 
and we work through the workshop process um, to formulate through these two, um, two workshops that we had. One was on a Saturday and one on a weekday evening, a uh, month or so apart, so that we could get the maximum amount of participants uh, to come. And we had a number of, a whole range of individuals. It was, it was quite wonderful. Uh, the workshops came up with 14 guidelines and goals. The first and most prominent was to improve visibility and open sight lines for, uh, throughout. And you can see from these photographs the problems with looking through the vegetation, these raised planters, and how it's kind of obstacles to viewpoints. Two, to create level, flexible, inviting to all plaza for the for daily life and special events as i've said there's lots of programming that goes on now it's very difficult to use that lawn area it is inaccessible to wheelchairs um, that so is the sunken courtyard around the existing fountain you can see in the top photograph this slope here this is the forecourt to the library and faulkner entry and is unusable as a gathering space to put a table or anything out there and and is non-compliant with present day americans with disabilities act uh, improve the pedestrian paseo a wider ramp uh, walkways better visibility and lighting you can see that um, Today, there, there were a lot of comments during the workshop that this paseo really looks much like a cattle chute with these high walls on either side, and the visibility is very low. It is also out of compliance with present day code. Uh, for improve lighting throughout, but keep it soft. Improve the entry walk and signage for the library. It's not the entry to the library is not very visible. And of course, these workshops took place before the eucalyptus were landmark. The feeling from the workshops was to remove the eucalyptus because they are the entry doors to the library are directly behind these trunks of these eucalyptus. It was a really a, a difficult decision for those involved in the workshops. They. Um, contemplated this, reflected upon it quite a bit, and there was a lot of discussion about it. In the end, they, they, they asked to have them removed. But as you can see, vegetation really blocks. You can't even see the front of the Faulkner in, in this particular image. Uh, replace the fountain with a lower, more appealing design. Um, you can see there the fountain sticking up right there on axis with the front door of the Faulkner. Remove the planters and plantings in front of the historic library entrance along Annapamu Street. There are a number of architectural tours that take place in downtown, and you can often see the tours standing here inside this little, little courtyard trying to look at that beautiful entablature there. Remove the lawn, small trees, hedges, and replace with low-growing, low-maintenance, resource-conserving materials. Consider removing the eucalyptus and trimming or removing the oaks. You can see under the oaks the lawn that has struggled, the city has struggled to maintain here, really not good for the lawn, for the oak trees, long-term viability and health. And a lot of people commented on that. And they were already looking to resource conservation even in 2011. <laughs> and, and of course, our water situation is much worse now. Um, add artworks and or installations relating to the library or literature. One example was a poet's corner recognizing the poet laureate program of Santa Barbara and somehow recognizing that within the plaza or within the surrounds and perhaps having installations of artworks um, for example from the um, special arts program at Santa Barbara High. Um, there's events that take place already having to do with that. Okay, uh, re relocate bicycle parking to our mis more visible location. This existing uh, bicycle parking is obscured by these walls and the planting around it, and there have been a number of bicycle thefts there. People are reluctant to leave their, their bikes there. A lot of bicyclists who came to the workshops complained about that. Add flexible seating, movable tables and chairs. Rather than fixed seating, people wanted seating that would accommodate special events, uh, maybe a dinner that would be out there, or reception, etc., or work tables for workshops, children's crafts, book signings. 
add activities and programming to activate the plaza refreshment cart. They thought about, and you can see the logo of the coffee cat, something like the coffee cat would have a, 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 a coffee and hot chocolate stand during the morning hour or whatever. Uh, uh, they were th talked about having a, an arts kiosk located in the project. Um, as you may be familiar with the community seed swap that takes place in the Faulkner, that's a hub of activity inside the Faulkner. There's always a couple of lonely, forlorn people out on the lawn trying to get kids to plant the seeds in their little paper cups. And um, it's inaccessible for strollers, it's inaccessible for wheelchairs, et cetera, and having a place that, that would be usable for all of these activities. And this was felt very strongly in, in, uh, in the workshop. There was a consensus, even though this was outside of the project scope of work at the time, um, add equal access to the south entrance of the library. You can see this signage on the entry arcade at the south entrance of the library. You can see it here along Library Avenue, this entrance. It's not accessible. There is no way to get a wheelchair inside that building at that uh, that. Um, entrance and the library um, avenue is inaccessible out of compliance with present day code you, uh, for wheelchairs to go down that, um, that uh, uh, library avenue. They have to travel down out to the east along Library Avenue, up Anacapa Street, across Anapamu Street, and into the front of the, of the library. That is the present path of travel. And even though, again, it was outside of the scope of the project at the time, improve the lower level plaza. This is Library Avenue Plaza is the actual name. The loading area that is sometimes used for special events, especially by the Museum of Art who hold their Day of the Dead uh, gathering there and other events throughout the year. And you can see it's quite heavily used for uh, uh, loading and unloading, especially for the lower level of the library here, for uh, which is used um, to transfer books for the bookmobile, etc. And you can see uh, the slope of this plaza is is way out of compliance. It is not um, up to present day codes as a gathering space. We went with this project with a conceptual design. Um, taken from these goals and guidelines for our project scope. We went to the HLC, and they had a number of comments about the project. Um, as you see here, that the project's overdue, that the design should celebrate the Faulkner Gallery, that the structures and plants in front of the Faulkner should be kept low, that the view of the library door should be open, uh, that the three eucalyptus trees, and you see here the, in this design, the eucalyptus are gone. That um, the commission re recommended the retention of the trees, although you can see there was discussion on the commission too about should they be kept, shouldn't they be kept. Um, it was a difficult issue for a number of people. Um, explore increasing the visibility of the buildings. Don't obscure the air area in front of the historic library door again. Uh, the design is too contemporary. Uh, look at recreating original reflecting pools in front of the Faulkner, which you saw in that earlier uh, photograph. Look at recreating, okay, the concept lacks formality in relationship to the Faulkner. Balance opening views up to the buildings with the amount of blank walls. Lighting fixtures should be special and functional. Design of pools must be safe. And the skyline trees are important. So the project, again, as, as Irene has um, noted, uh, started again in 2003 with the recognition that there were some larger issues and the the urban design issues, so the scope of work expanded by the city to include all the public lands around the precinct of the library, so that as the project, the 2011 project focused on this area here to the north of the library in the Faulkner. Now the lower library plaza is included and Library Avenue is included all the way around the library. And here you see that scope of work again. So the project scope increased primarily, as Irene noted, to, with the addition of creating equal access, universal, compliant ADA access throughout the site. 
So we looked at the larger area and the urban design issues. How do we connect? How do people get to the library? Well, one primary way is by public transit. And there is one bus stop that's actually on the site, which is proposed to become a super stop in the future. So it'll have more amenities associated with it and wider use. And that is the bus stop along Anacapa Street that you see here. Um, and there's another one adjacent, which is along not on the site, but adjacent in front of the Museum of Art here. We're looking towards State Street along Anapamu, and it's this bus stop right here. Um, there are also two parking garages, uh, one across the street here from the Granada Garage. This is the new Paseo from the Granada Garage. And then, of course, the library parking structure to the south of the library along Library Avenue. There's also a number of uh, bicycle parking that's accommodated on the site for bicycle transit. You see uh, this problematic bicycle parking here that is the closest to the north entry to the library in the Faulkner. And what happens, because people don't want to leave their bicycles there, uh, they wind up piling them up right here near the entry of the library, uh, chaining them to the um, trash cans, etc. Um, and then at the south of the library, there is this, this uh, bike parking, and down at the lower level in the lower plaza, bike parking here. There are two paseos on the site. This, the Kalashoot Paseo, as you saw, here is the Museum of Art and the lawn front, front of the library. Um, this is the, the route to the bicycle parking and the Faulkner. And, of course, Library Avenue Plaza, which people use, although the grading is, is not compliant, as I said. And then this connector, this is the library parking structure to the south, and this um, connects to Figueroa Street. There are two potential gathering sites, or real gathering sites, of course. There is the existing lawn, Library Plaza, as I said, inaccessible. And then there's this lower level um, of Library Avenue Plaza. So these existing accessibility issues that I've, I've mentioned, you can see here I, um, in this photograph how this cross slope is very steep. As you can see the line here, and this whole, whole uh, roadway is, is very steep. And here, too, this is, again, the bike parking. This is meant to be the equal access ramp, which is out of compliance and, of course, very unpleasant um, And uh, as, you, as you walk up towards the Faulkner. The so-called level areas are also problematic in terms of present-day ADA. You can see here, again, is uh, this slope and the forecourt in front of the library and the uh, Faulkner Gallery is unusable for a gathering space. And here you see the two steps coming into the Faulkner. Um, this is now just a fire exit uh, from the Faulkner coming out. But these steps make this area inaccessible. You can see here the struggles with a stroller. Um, you would have to do the same thing with a wheelchair carry it up onto the lawn in order to access the lawn. And you can see the kind of skateboard park uh, uh, grading of this lower plaza. So the current design here is a, a, a bird's eye view of it as if from the Granada with the oak trees in front, the Faulkner Gallery, the combined entry to the library in Faulkner, historic library here. So here is Library Plaza, the Paseo, um, at the the recreation, the re the revisioning of the fountain, the three part fountain that leads to the Faulkner, and a more open entryway uh, connector from Anapamu Street here in the foreground to the to the entry to the library in Faulkner. This is taken from the uh, southwest as if you were hovering in a balloon above La Arcata, looking down at Library Avenue Plaza. Here's the widened and opened 
uh, Paseo, you can see that the planter walls are all removed. This planting is in the ground, planting on either side in the ground. Uh, we do the same here with Library Avenue Plaza. Instead of the high planters on either side, they're low planters. The planting, as much as possible, is in the ground. Um, and all of this is now accessible. All of it is accessible throughout. It's important to understand this project in terms of the grading, the topographic grading. I know most people's eyes roll back in their head when I say, oh, grading. You know, it's like talking about root canal or something, but it's not that complex. It's a fact of the site. It's dealing with the reality of the site. And um, so in this, uh, in this drawing, You'll see that the yellow signifies areas that are flat, that can be used as gathering spaces. They slope less than 2%. So um, as we move up from Annapamu Street, we've opened up this view and the walkway, the entryway to the, to the combined entry, which is here. Um, and you can see these areas, which are orange, are areas that slope less than 1 in 20. That's about the slope of, oh, maybe the sidewalk in front of the uh, library along, um, on the side of the library along Anacapa Street. It's a very gentle slope. It's actually gentler than that, but that, so that's what it is. And what that means is that, in terms of landscape architecture, is that... Um, you do not need to have handrails. So it's just an open walkway, a sloped walkway. The areas in blue are ramps. They require handrails. So essentially, the topography of, this, a topography of the site requires that we have ramps in some places. Here we have a ramp, and we've added the switchback. And this is a wonderful opportunity. It's absolutely amazing. This piece of the library is part of the renovation uh, that took place in the 70s. And so it's not a historic part of the library. We're able to put a switchback ramp here and come up the five feet that we need to get into the library on the south side of the library so that we'll have equal access in the future. We've also regraded Library Avenue so that and separated pedestrian and vehicular traffic as requested by the city. It's a policy of the city. So that this is 1 in 20 coming down. It's separated with a curb for the vehicles and pedestrians and walking, and we can come down into Lower Library Avenue Plaza. And we have this connection for, for handicapped access to the south side of the library from the existing parking, down the Paseo, across this walkway, and up then up the ramps into the library. Lower Library Avenue, we regrade. We bring it up as much as one and a half feet, essentially, but it slopes so much. It's not, in some places, it's not raised at all. So to make it flat and usable, so it is then compliant with present-day code, uh, we have widened the, the uh, pedestrian paseo here along the side of the library, and there's some portions of ramp to get you up to the library plaza. Uh, the fountain is in three parts, just like the original fountain, and we have these sloped walkways in between the sections of the fountain to provide complete access to this uh, to the plaza. We also have a forecourt that's a usable forecourt. It's a little bit bigger than the existing one that's there now. To, so that if you had a, an art opening, for example, in the Faulkner, you could have a refreshment cart or the tickets outside and people can walk back and forth. And Irene has suggested that we could open that original door. There are no stairs anymore. This will be flat. So everyone can come in and out of the real doors to the Faulkner on special events and special occasions. We've also opened up the view to the uh, to the original historic doors, taken away those planter, planters and Hollywood junipers. The elevation now of this plaza is about the same as the Annapamu Street sidewalk, so that these relate visually one to the other, so you can see right into that plaza. So there's no hiding places, essentially, in the plaza. Here's the demolition plan. Um, so we're taking away, and this includes all these planters, et cetera, out front, removing the fountain there, these planters in front of the library, the planters in front of the historic library. Um, 
And of course, this will have to, all of this will be demoed and replaced. Um, the, this is the uh, uh, scope of work, really, in the trees from the project from, from 2011. Um, and uh, this is what we had presented to you previously, where we're removing, and I will go through these trees as we remove them, and, the, and I will go through the trees that we're adding. Uh, this is the new scope. The project site doubled in size, I'd say. And this is the new scope, and I'll, I'll take you through these trees. So the remo trees to be removed, 18 Indian hawthorn trees, Raphaelopsis majestic beauty here. And you can see them here. They're, they ring the lawn. Um, the city has asked that they, the Parks Department has asked that they be relocated off site. We don't know really where yet. Also to be relocated are the four saucer magnolias that surround the fountain. You can see them. They're kind of buried in the boxwood around the fountain, and there's, there's four of them there. Four Hollywood junipers to be removed, and these two in front of the historic library. There's one here in front of the Faulkner Gallery, and one here down below in front of the, the lower entry to the Faulkner Gallery. This is taken from the, combi the, the kind of corner where the lower entry to the Museum of Art and La Arcada. So it's looking across, and you can see how it really blocks this entry, um, makes it uh, cuts down the visibility of coming in and out of that lower entry for library staff. Another of the trees to be removed is the uh, eucalyptus nicolai in this planter at the base of the Paseo. As I said, what we want to do is take this planter down to grade level and plant in the ground rather than have these high planters on either side. And you can see the cracks in the planter. When we were working in 2011, those cracks were there. And um, over the interim, as the project was stalled for a while, the city came and repaired those planters and repainted them. And if you walk out there today, you'll see the cracks are back. <laughs> Eucalyptus do not really like to be in containers. Certain plant materials don't like the life in a container, and the eucalyptus are one of them, and you can see that here. Um, this is another uh, eucalyptus nicolai here along the uh, Library Avenue. You can see it leaning over the avenue, and it has dropped a number of branches, which you see here, the, this eucalyptus is known as self-pruning and drops the, these branches on occasion, and um, so we would like to remove those too. There's one more, and it's next to the other. Um, and then there's five kumquats to be removed. You can see they're not doing well. They've lost most of their vegetation over the years. Um, they have continued in their decline since we started working on the project. And the city has decided that they are not to be relocated. So here is the planting plan. Um, I know it's hard to read <laughs> when it's in detail with the shrubs and the, the trees. And I will go into this in right here. Here's the plant list. As you can see from the designations here, all of these plant, almost all of these plants are drought adapted and resource conserving, uh, meaning that they use very little, uh, they need very little additive soil amendments. They do well in the soils of Santa Barbara, and they need very little pruning or maintenance in, in that regard, so human hours to care for them. Uh, they're the trees that are not, oh, and then and then also, the all but three of the plants are on the El Pueblo Viejo plant list, recommended plant list. One of them is the Marcamia Hildebrandii with the Nile trumpet tree, which. Uh, is a plant we, we thought quite suitable to reinforce the Egyptian motif of the Faulkner Gallery and is a wonderful small tree, flowering tree, fall, flowers with a beautiful yellow blossom, and you can see it in downtown Santa Barbara. Um, and the two other plants not on the list and are not drought adapted are the two water plants in the fountain. One of them is a dwarf papyrus, of course, for the Egyptian motif, and the other is a water lily. 
Um, so the touchstones for the design and uh, creating the plant list and creating the design at large and the detail, really we look back to the Spanish Renaissance revival of the Santa Barbara Library and, of course, the Faulkner Gallery with its Egyptian zigzag modern motif. So we go back to the originals, not the revival, past the originals to the, to the, to the originals. And we have here three uh, tomb artifacts from Egypt. Um, uh, this uh, wall painting and incised in size tablet is, shows the hand of the pharaoh, Akhenaten, and there's a wonderful poem he has with this, and he's offering this beautiful olive branch to Ra, the sun god, and look at the sun's rays with their hands coming down to receive this magnificent olive branch. Uh, we have a tomb maquette. This is from the Museum of uh, Muse Museum Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. This maquette is in the basement. It shows uh, sycamore trees around a central fountain. It's the earliest representation of a, of a garden that we know of. Um, and then this uh, wall painting from an Egyptian tomb. You can see the zigzag motif perfectly with the zigzag modern of the Faulkner and the fabulous palm trees planted along this waterway. Um, for our uh, presentation for HLC, of course, we prepare elevations of the existing, showing the existing, and then showing the uh, design proposal. So the existing design is on the is the top uh, rendering, and the proposed design is on the lower. The, only the only pieces that are colored are the changes that we're making, the additions we're making. We don't really show here. You can see the Indian hawthorn here underneath the oaks. You can see what happens when those are removed. Those oaks are fabulous sculptural. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to say creatures, <laughs> and um, to see them against the light is going to be fantastic with the light on the plaza. The photograph that I showed in the beginning when you saw the light raking across the front of the, of the Faulkner Gallery, the Faulkner Gallery faces north, so that must have been taken pretty much around the summer solstice. So you'll have the backlit of these fabulous oak trunks, which you'll be able to see. And you can see the, the Faulkner again reading as an object against the sky as it was originally intended. Um, and you can see this, the planting is, is colored here. So uh, part of this uh, design is that we widen the sidewalk along Annapamu Street. It gets down to three and a half feet right here uh, between this, the edge of this tree well and tree grate and this planter, which we are removing. So we're bring, cutting into the lawn, removing the lawn, we'll save a little water there. Um, and adding sidewalk here to make the sidewalk in compliance with the downtown guidelines. Uh, so here we see the front of the historic library and I put the plant materials below so you can see the plant materials that we are suggesting. Um, here on the corner is the relocated Mediterranean fan palm which was in front of the library. Um, in the planter it will be easy to really relocate this multi-trunked tree. Um, in front of, to call out, you can see the planters are gone with the Hollywood juniper here. This is Dorianthus, as you see here, an upright, uh, or it says relative of agave, but it is not armed, it's unarmed. And it makes a nice um, uh, symmetrical uh, frame for the library with uh, Carissa, natal plum below it. This is um, in honor of the DeForest Corner, which is at the corner of Annapamu and State Street, which is planted with Carissa, and we thought we would repeat the same plant material down the block along Annapamu. We're also balancing the existing uh, camellias, which are here behind the boxwood uh, little boxwood hedge here. We add, there's nothing here now. We add the camellias back so that this is balanced and symmetrical on either side, recognizing this uh, Spanish Renaissance revival of the building. 
So then in front of the library in the Faulkner, here's the low fountain. You're looking at it head on. It steps forward as it comes down the slope. It's never more than about two, two feet, maybe two feet one inch high as it steps down according to the slope. And it has pl- some plantings in it on either side. Uh, oh, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so underneath the eucalyptus, uh, we've suggested uh, Australian fuchsia, Corea, um, as a plant that will hopefully be able to withstand the litter uh, from the eucalyptus and also their invasive roots, which are in this area. Everything that uh, we have watched different plant material go into these planters o- over the time we've been working on this project. And it is very difficult to grow under eucalyptus when they com- become this mature and they've sent out this net of, of roots. And of course, as I said, the, the litter and the oil from the litter of their leaves. Under the oaks, we're suggesting this cotoneaster dameri low fast. It's a very low-growing cotoneaster. It takes, it's incredibly drought adapted. It is uh, very low, up to maybe six inches high. It spreads out quite wide as a mat um, to discourage traffic underneath these oaks to replace this lawn and not to plant right around the base of the oaks, but on the edges. And we'll plant from very small containers and allow it to spread out over time. Um, um, Alongside the fountain, we use um, agapanthus, lily of the Nile, again, the Egyptian idea. And um, this, of course, photograph was taken right down the street in front of Union Bank. You can see this combination with the strelitzia, the Birds of Paradise. We're using Birds of Paradise here at the entry to the Faulkner. That's because the slope, as I said, it's it's about um, 18 inches below the Faulkner's as you go down to the plaza, so it kind of takes up that slope a bit and is against the wall. And, of course, it, too, is an African plant, although it comes from South Africa. And it, too, is is very drought-adapted and will do well in this condition. Also, the library is considering a new logo and one of the logo suggestions is a is involves a bird of paradise motif so if it does go through it would be a nice to have the actual plant there along the paseo this is a uh, east facing wall but because this slopes up to the plaza along the paseo it is in shade much of the year, and especially here under, still uh, uh, at the edge of the drip line of the oaks. We've suggested some clivia along this edge, and an, a number of other plants. Ruscus is one of them, which is used there at the corner uh, with the museum. This is a section through the two plazas. So here is Annapamustri. Here's the oak tree. Here's the existing lawn. You can see the fountain behind, the eucalyptus. You can see the library behind. You're looking at the side of the Faulkner uh, through these these sets of walls here. Here's the bike parking right here and down to the lower level of Library Avenue Plaza. And here's the lower entry to the Faulkner where where the library staff um, uh, receive and send out books. And then here is Library Avenue here going back up towards Anacapa Street. So um, a little closer, you can see the trees that we're using here. And there's a couple trees that you don't see because of the cut um, in the plaza. In the plaza, we're suggesting olives, two olives. Uh, They're the Swan Hill olive. They're not only fruitless, but they have no flowers, so they produce no pollen, so there's no um, aggravation for people who have an allergic reaction to the pollen. Uh, We're also using Platinus racemosa, the California sycamore, in honor and a tip of the hat to the uh, uh, Asian sycamore that that grows in Egypt. Um, but, of course, our sycamore will provide habitat for wildlife. It's an important plant, especially for hummingbirds, and a lot of birds use um, the, the uh, western sycamore. Um, against the wall, you'll see here, so here's two sycamores. They're also planted here to give shade to this lower plaza, which, if you've gone through it, you know can get quite hot. And they provide shade and cooling during the summer for the Faulkner itself to reduce the heat load for the Faulkner Gallery as, uh, for its energy consumption. 
So looking again at this plaza, the lower plant material, again, birds of paradise here, and at the lower entry of the Faulkner too, so we use that as a signature plant to call out the entry. We've used Nephophia, which is also an African plant, the red hot poker, all of these are drought adapted dwarf pomegranate, the shrimp plant from Mexico, and the Japanese privet along the wall to La Arcada, because that is kind of a signature plant for La Arcada. We want to recognize its importance presence on this lower courtyard, and hopefully they will want to use that, that courtyard for events too. Um, these are small bits of color, dashes of color. They're meant to bloom over the year. Some bloom in the wintertime, some bloom in the summer and the spring, etc. so that there's always some color there. Uh, this is looking at the uh, south elevation of the library. So here you can see the new uh, equal access ramp on this new addition part to the library, the lower library plaza here, library avenue, uh, lo library avenue plaza, and then along uh, library avenue plaza. Here is where the handicap ramp will come through this opening that already exists right here. This will entail the relocation of this beautiful Senegal date palm, which is right here. The Senegal date palm will be moved to the corner of uh, Library Avenue Plaza and Anacapa Street, a new sign for the library, the Art Museum in La Arcata, right here on this corner to let you know that you can walk down in this direction. And so this tree is kind of a signature at the end, just like the Mediterranean fan palm at the corner of Anacapa and Anapamu. One of the uh, problems we, we hope to alleviate is that this uh, existing Caliandra, as you see here and here and here, have grown up quite high. They get up to 16 feet, 20 feet tall. They are obscuring views down into the sunken area around the lower level of the library, which is which will become the children's wing. So they block light and air circulation down into this area. The whole point of digging that out was so that you could have light and air into the lower plaza. And this Caliandra really obscures it. The Parks Department Department is, of course, maintains this. They keep trimming it up, trimming it up. It's kind of a battle. Uh, so we want to remove that. We want to replace, and some of the slope planting has totally disappeared. There's just dirt here. We want to replace this slope planting with low-growing plant materials that will hold the slope, maintain the slope, and offer... Uh, will enhance views from inside the library out so that we're looking at kind of a, an Egyptian carpet effect, really, with a multiple, several different plant materials um, planted here. And um, so again, here, down here in Library Plaza, we have a wall where we're able to plant some aloe, some spider aloe, also a plant that's a signature plant of Africa, all, grows all around the Mediterranean. So the spider aloe here, we're again using the Australian fuchsia. Here is the Nile trumpet tree. We place it right near the entry uh, on this side against this south-facing wall. Again, birds of paradise. And then we use some lantana and cantoni aster and this Australian fuchsia here on this slope, so you can see it opened up. So essentially, here is the design, again looking at uh, lower, uh, lower Library Avenue Plaza, the wider Paseo coming up. The width of the Paseo at this point requires that we put a bollard here at the end and another one up at the top to ensure that trucks or, or the stray vehicle won't consider this an alleyway and drive right up. Uh, we have, here is the Library Plaza, the Fountain, Library Avenue, and then from uh, the Granada again, looking down towards the same design. Thank you, Regula. I have um, one more uh, speaker here, um, and that's John Glasso, who is representing the library board. Uh, Chair Eric Friedman wasn't able to be here, but um, uh, John asked to say a few words. I can't possibly compete with that presentation, <laughs> but we, as a representative of the commissioners, I, I stand with their attention to this detail and, and have read through all of the 
documents, but I am by no means an expert compared to this. So we stand with them and we thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you for that um, wonderful presentation. Uh, it was really informative. Um, we don't have anyone for public comment on this, it looks like. No speaker slip. So I'm going to close public comment, and I'm going to just open it up to the commission for questions and comments. Our goal here is to provide comments to the Historic Landmarks Commission on the design they're going to see, see it soon, right? I can't remember. Uh, yeah. Chair Wiscombe yeah. and commissioners, I just wanted to, we have a couple of new commissioners, so I wanted to kind of the scope of your comments. Um, and as they're before the Park and Recreation Commission, um, there are really two focus areas. One is trees, and uh, because those are within your jurisdiction, General comments on how the design serves the public are always appreciated. Um, and then always the library is a general fund um, public building. So that means that it is maintained by our park staff. Parks have been um, involved in many meetings talking about what the landscape needs would be and the recommendations of plants. So um, those are really the two focus areas for you. I just wanted to make sure that we kind of had that scope because it's a, a very big, complex project. Um, but that's really the focus for the commission. OK. Thank you very much for that. Um, does anyone have a question or comments? Ms. Longstreet? Did you? Sure do. Um, I did take a walk around yesterday, and the library is definitely in need of some love around the edges. Uh, I have a, you touched on it a little bit about the um, children's remodel. Is there still some talk about uh, changing the access point? Are they going to have a separate entrance? I thought that came uh, up at one Chair point. Chair Wiscombe, Commissioner Longstreet. Um, there was a lot of talk about that, and in the end, um, the options proved um, cost prohibitive. So um, at this point, it's strictly an internal remodel. Okay. When, um, when I walked around yesterday, I noticed that the camellias that are in there are really leggy, and they're the ones I think on Anacapa Street. Is there a reason to retain camellias is that the bit I'm, the ma I'm just looking at it from a maintenance and what they kind of look like point of view well I'm not a camellia expert okay um, camellias really they, they need pruning and the ones along Anacapa Street rather than Anapamu Street yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah the ones yeah on Anacapa yeah. Anacapa not Anapamu not in a promote. Uh -huh. um, they probably need some pruning and they probably need some feeding. And well, that's but, what I was wondering. Is it seems like a pretty high maintenance plant to put in where actually, we know we have no maintenance. Yes, yes, yes. Um, one of um, well, we're ready for working drawing. No, but when we get there, um, we will include soil regeneration in our working drawings. And we have a number of materials that we use to provide for in, um, the health of the soil structure and the soil organisms, the mycorrhizal fungi, et cetera. And that really helps things like, especially like the camellias. The camellias really are historic. They were put in with the building. They are of the period. They were really popular during the period. I would hesitate. They also are very drought adapted when they get going when they're that size. So I, I don't know, but that's a good well, thing I, to take in mind. We, I, that we should would be go a forward comment, would looking. be the concern about the maintenance of that. Yeah. Um, is, the refl is it a reflecting pool or a fountain? Oh, it, it, I'd, say, I'd say it's both. <laughs> it's a, it will have a very small amount of water, just a couple of inches. And where yeah. we have the plant material, we 
lower, we, we have a lower compartment with a gray over it and the plants come up through it. So there's very little water, but it serves as a reflecting pool. So it'll have a dark bottom. And who will maintain the reflecting pool? I, I would think with the leaf drop and all of that, it would take a lot of maybe daily maintenance. I can respond to that. Um, that is something that we have talked a lot about. And um, currently, the fountain that is in place is owned by Larcata and maintained by Larcata. And we're going to look to that model and um, look for someone that will adopt it and will provide um, funding, an endowment to keep it going. We recognize that that is um, a cost. I, I just hate to see us put things in that we're embarrassed five years later because we can't maintain. I just, I think we have to just be more proactive than that. Um, is there the possibility of revenue from rental of this, the plaza? Yes. And, um, and how does this museum, is that city property that you will then be sharing? Will it be rented? Help me with that. Yes. Uh, the library, the central library has um, a fee structure for rental of not just the rooms, but also the art gallery, so the walls. And we do have a, a fee in place for the rental of the front plaza. Currently, it rarely gets rented because of its configuration. But um, once um, we have a newly redesigned plaza, we'll look to... Um, increase the fee, um, so it will be a revenue-generating um, opportunity. Well, I am just pleased to see um, this at least coming together, because it, it, is, it seems a strong word, and I, it, it, an embarrassment when you walk around our library that, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's tired, and it would be lovely to see it rejuvenated. Um, I, I think it's so important to have the access issues addressed all the way across, um, especially from the parking lot. Many, many people use the, that, that walkway to the Granada at night to have it safer and more open and more accessible to those with disabilities is important and strollers. Uh, so, you know, I am supportive of what I see. There's probably details everybody's going to have a little bit about, um, but... I would love to see this project be able to move forward. Great. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else? Yes, Mr. Ferrara. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. That was really great. I, I enjoyed that. I want to also thank Campbell and Campbell for the bird's eye rendering. That really makes a big difference there <laughs> where you can look at it like that. Um, I just want to make a couple comments on our street tree advisories, uh, attachment four here. Um, and go along with what they have here. Had, I have no issue with the tree removals or relocations. I think that's great. I like the plants, the, the way you described it and how they're going to be laid out there. Um, I do have an issue with uh, considering taller plants, uh, at, least, at least two feet high, uh, taller plants uh, around the uh, planters that contain the oaks. I, want, I think it's really important to have that straight line view and nothing to block the view from the street for security reasons and such. So I'd like to see that uh, the way you've laid it out so far. Um, and I just uh, had a question about you mentioned that you're going to be relocating the bicycle parking oh, area in the oh, front. Oh, yeah. But I don't think you mentioned where you were going to be yes. relocating it um, to. You could just barely see it right here. It's here, and um, it's in front of the... Uh, library, uh, not in front of the entryway. There was a lot of discussion about that. They didn't want a bunch of bikes piled in front of the entryway. Uh, a lot of people mentioned that. So it's here between the pairs along the sidewalk. So it's in full view. So it's not, the bikes are not going to be stolen. And then there's more, we've added more bike pa parking along the Paseo between uh, the connection between Library Avenue and the uh, parking structure. So we have par more parking on either side. And then, yes, and then we retain this bike parking here at the lower library plaza, and we've made that larger because we anticipate increased bike transit. Yeah, I think that's a great idea and a good So location. there's more in here. 
right, right yeah. here. They do have two areas down in yeah. there too, so that's good. And uh, they, the Street Tree Advisory Committee did mention something about uh, they'd like to see vertical element, possibly trees against the museum wall to frame the space. Could you address that a little? Yes, bit? they were talking about trees along the Paseo here. The we had originally originally included Kentia palms, Howia palms along that edge, and uh, the museum asked us to remove the trees along this edge, so we took them out. Okay, very good. Well, I think it's a great plan. I think you guys done a great job, and uh, that's all I'd like to, to say. I really okay, thank you very much. Does anyone else have any comments? Um, yes, Mr. Casey. Yes. Okay, you go after Chris. In walking around um, <clears throat> the library today, I, if you're coming from the courthouse, down Library Avenue, and on the left is the parking structure. You pass the entrance to the library. There's a elevated planter. Is that like a phoenix? Could it? That's the phoenix reclinata. That's the Senegal date palm. There's one in there. Okay. That's it. That we're going to move to the corner. There's okay, one. Good. There's one. It's there's pretty sad. Yeah, but you know, I think if it's you know move to the corner not quite under the eucalyptus. <laughs> the eucalyptus wreak havoc with all those planters along that edge. Okay. And I support your project. It's um, wonderful, and I look forward to enjoying it in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Heaton. Yeah, um, thank you for, for the presentation, the project, coming on to it. Um, you know, fairly new, I and... You know, I'm enthusiastically supporting it. I think it's a great um, improvement to the area, recognizing the historic value and yet creating some, you know, usable future um, for the for the library. I'm you know looking forward to that. As far as um, uh, our areas of, of comment, I guess I um, I'm sad to see the cum kumquat trees go. Uh, you know, that's a part of my ritual with my little ones to the library is making a visit there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I can understand if, if they are, um, you know, not fitting in the motif. It would have been nice if, if we could have kept something. But um, I guess that's, you know, the one comment I got. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Rebe. I think, hi, I have a few comments. And one is I want to commend the library for working with the museum. That's something that's not altogether that common, but very helpful. Uh, great, great way to show uh, working with our neighbors. I'm curious if you know uh, what was the reasoning of going from the reflecting pool to the fountain and back to the reflecting pool. I wonder if it was a logistical issue or only a design issue in the first change. Just oh, I. I would use the terms interchangeably, kind of. The, I mean, it's. Uh, um, I always just say fountain water feature is the wonderful prosaic. I word. think she's asking about the fountain that exists now. Oh, the fountain that exists now? Right. Ah, yes. Well, um, this was a his. If we go back to the very beginning, gee, I hate to bring you back all the way. We'll go back. Yes, the existing fountain um, or the existing reflecting pools were built in 1930, and at some point, I think they were planted. I, I wasn't here yet, but um, they were planted <laughs> in, um, and they were actually removed um, in the 1980 remodel. And my understanding is that there were funds available. They needed to spend them in a hurry, and they came up with a, a quick design, um, and uh, so that fountain was given to the library by Hugh Peterson, who, as I said, maintained it, and Larkata has continued to maintain it. So, um, and um, following, the, well, we did plan to do away with it from the beginning. Um, we had a smaller fountain, um, and the feedback from the public meetings and from HLC were to to bring back um, the original look. So, it's, thank you. That's the background. Thank you. And the last 
question or a comment is, I don't know how any of these plants smell, but it's always nice to have things that that are pleasant to have around, either at different times of uh, the year. And I know in the spring there's a lot of things that smell great around around town. And so if we have anything that that's particularly pleasant, it's good to have, as it generates good memories of of coming home. Great. But I just say that is a wonderful comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yes, there are plant materials that in the in the project that that do have fragrance. Yes, and when you have a courtyard, it's a wonderful opportunity because in a more closed environment, then you can really smell the materials. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. K. Spear. Did you have something? Just one other thought about the fountain that will be removed and it's the property of La Arcata. Um, if, if La Arcata has no use for it, Santos, could we put that in some other park? <laughs> or is that too much to... Thank you, Nancy, I got it. <laughs> I, think, I think you got the evil eye on that one. <laughs> Actually, design on a roll. Can, can yeah. we have the same relationship with the uh, uh, who's going to maintain it and yeah. all of right. that? Exactly. And it has had a lot of problems recently, so I think it's kind of um, in decline. Um, we did meet with uh, uh, Lynn Tamajan from Larcata yesterday, and she did say that um, um, that we could give it to the restore. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you uh, very much. I do have some comments. Um, first of all, I, um, I know I speak for all of the commissioners here when I say we appreciated the uh, large drawings rather than the eight and a half by 11, so the ones that were sent out. So that, that was really great. Um, I'm very pleased to see the scope increased on this project to, um, I was very concerned when it came by before, just from, the, just from the standpoint of usability and accessibility of the space for everyone. And I just think that with the scope increased, we've really addressed um, a, a tremendous amount of the issues related to grade and also the issues related to accessibility and usability now, um, which is which is really wonderful. Um, I appreciate um, your enormous respect for trees. I think that um, the uh, the trees that are being removed are ones that that you know I would certainly support removal of. Um, and the reuse of some of them, um, Mr. Escobar taking uh, the um, Raphaelipus and, and relocating that will be, um, is really nice. Um, and um, I also appreciate the, the, I will call it the water feature for <laughs> As a landscape architect, that's just the safest definition. But um, bringing back that water feature, I think, is is um, really a, a wonderful idea. I, I really do. I think that that um, is is just blends in really well with this project. Um, and I also appreciate the. Um, the taking out the lawn under the oaks and, and putting in the ground covers, I think, you know, if we can discourage foot traffic in that area, I think that will help without um, decreasing visibility. So, and I think those are two goals, and I think you've done a nice job with um, ground covering in there. Um, regarding the museum wall, um, Street Tree Advisory Committee, uh, when they saw the project, wanted to see, that's a, that's a big blank wall, and um, they wanted to see some vertical plantings to soften the effects of that wall. And um, it was it came to our attention um, at the at the stack meeting that 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 the museum may use that wall to show movies. So uh, I think Street Tree Advisory Committee understood that, but still would like to see some vertical plantings along each side out 
out of the area where the where the actual screen projection would be for the movies and I would agree with that I think that 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 um, does need a, a vertical plant element um, even if it's just in the off the off to the edges of the screen where the screen would be um, and I appreciate the the grading on the project. I'm one that actually loves to grade. So, but um, a, the five percent or less with uh, no handrails, you know, achieving that just gives that more open feeling and uh, will will really, I think, help the public use the space well. You know, not to have a lot of handrails and and ramps there. I know there's places that are required to have them, but but it's going to give it a much more open feeling and more usable spaces. Um, I also appreciate the indoor outdoor concept at the Faulkner. You talked about that, and you know, and I think that's going to be a wonderful a wonderful space and really probably help with with rental of that space um, when you can flow people outdoors from from the Faulkner. Um, and I talked about that. I like the introduction of the um, Nile tulip tree. I thought that was really, really nice. And I, I in particular, like the plant selection. I, like Miss Longstreet, am a little bit iffy on camellias, but I understand the um, intent, and I just hope that it isn't going to be a big maintenance um, headache for parks. That's, that's, um, and um, I also appreciated the removal of the coleandra um, for, for more light. I thought that was, that's really going to really make a difference. So, so all in all, um, uh, I think that the, the plant palette's great. Uh, where you're removing trees, you've justified it, and in other areas you are, um, you're really celebrating trees, which I think is, is, is really great, and the design shows that. Um, and uh, when Ms. Rapp said how the design serves the public, I think this is going to serve the public really, really well. Uh, it is, the visibility obviously is extremely important, and your design is is open and um, will really, I think, help with safety issues in that area. And um, I hope the project moves forward. So thank you very, very much for the wonderful presentation and the hard work. It's pretty exciting. Oh. OK. Anyone else? OK. Thank you again. And um, we're going to move on to agenda item number three, which is the urban forest management plan. So we're going to hear a presentation on that, and then we have to make a recommendation to, um, to city council. Uh, hmm? Sure, we can do that. I, I always forget about that. But yes, let's take a let's take a five-minute break and we convene the um, Parks and Recreation Commission meeting and we are on agenda item number three which is the urban forest management plan. Ms. Zachary, welcome. Chair Wiscom and members of the Commission, uh, today we have uh, for you a presentation of the proposed urban forest management plan. Um, the Commission has discussed this and seen this and commented on it. Uh, for quite some time over we started it 18 months ago, but we talked about it earlier than 18 months ago Our new commissioners don't have that benefit, but rest assured This is just the beginning and there's lots of implementation Which is really what we're hoping to get to in very short order uh, So with that I'd like to turn the presentation over to Mandy Burgess She's an analyst in our department and she's been a key staff member working with me and Tim Downey we had a technical advisory committee uh, to put together this plan that uh, you'll consider today. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Burgess. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, as Ms. Zachary mentioned, this commission has been um, apprised of the going on of the Urban Forest Management Plan project for the past nearly 18 months now. We were most recently here in August of 2013 uh, looking at draft objectives and actions. Today we'll present the proposed plan to you today. 
Um, uh, today's presentation, we'd like to talk a little bit uh, for our new commissioners, um, what we're talking about when we talk about the urban forest um, policies that guide our tree management. Of course, the plan, it's uh, proposed objectives and actions. Uh, look quickly at our remaining schedule. It is coming to a close, and um, we have been going to boards and commissions along this process, and throughout December and January, provide you with some of their comments, and ultimately, ultimately we're looking for this commission to uh, recommend that City Council adopt the plan. So with that, when we talk about the uh, urban forest, we're talking about all the trees, both public and private. Uh, our urban forest is made up of naturalized forests. We have diversity parks. It's our street trees. It's our private uh, tree population. And Santa Barbara benefits from a rich horticultural history that uh, early plantings in the 1800s, 1900s brought a barren landscape, an oak woodland landscape, into a diverse landscape. Um, that diversity has made us unlike most other uh, California cities. We have a very rich, uh, diverse urban forest, and it certainly characterizes um, Santa Barbara's neighborhoods and uh, certain areas within the, within the city. When we talk about uh, city-owned trees, we're talking about street trees, park and facility trees, uh, all the trees in the undeveloped place, uh, spaces of open, sp open space parks. Uh, we have roughly 450 different species of trees that are owned and managed by the city, uh, yet over uh, 90 of those occur only once. Your staff report provides more detail and information on the prevalence of trees. But part of what this plan looks to do is to look into the future uh, to address certain issues like our tree diversity. The urban forest also includes trees on private property. It's estimated that there's uh, roughly 320,000 trees in the urban forest. About 80% of that is on private property. One of the first steps in plan development was uh, conducting a tree canopy assessment, and this is a type of assessment you would do when you don't have the resources to go out and count every single tree. It gives you a broad overview of what uh, tree canopy looks like. And citywide, we have just over 25% of our land surfaces covered by a canopy of trees. When we look at different land uses, you'll see there's, uh, it's, it's varied um, there. We did provide the commission back in March of 2013 a more detailed report on that. But um, here's some numbers up here. Our residential and open space park areas in the upper 20s. And probably no surprise when you get down to office and industrial areas, it's in the lower uh, you know, teens and, and below. Uh, similarly, if you look just within residential zones, you would find the variation. Some of our neighborhoods, San Marcan, San Roque, a high canopy as you get closer to uh, the beachfront areas, lower east side, lower canopy. Um, so quickly, just a quick piece about the benefits of trees. We know the benefits go beyond aesthetics. There's environmental benefits, of course, shade and improvement of air and water quality, but also community health and well-being. More studies are coming out about just how trees and the social benefits are linked. Um, provide recreation, a food source. We've touched on some of our horticultural, horticultural heritage that our trees provide and some of our parks, such as the Alamitas and Franceschis, really hold some magnificent specimens that uh, link that uh, horticultural history and cultural history. Uh, at the same time, they require care and maintenance, which also, ha which also has a financial um, impact. They need space to grow. That space to grow can impact our need for infrastructure and vice versa. Um, they block views and can drop leaves and fruit. Uh, they also have a defined lifespan. Um, once again, this, this plan looks to take a proactive approach um, in, in dealing with some of these main key issues. As you'll see if you look through the plan, our actions directly respond to a lot of the key, key issues that we have identified throughout this plan development. So management of the city's urban forest is guided by a number of policies. A few of those are up here on the slide, but not up here. It includes the general plan, wildland fire plan, uh, local coastal plan. Um, the street tree master plan adopted in 77 is a comprehensive plan for planting and maintaining uh, Santa Barbara city tr street tree population. It's most active um, part of that plan is the street tree designation listing used regularly uh, for street tree planting options and to maintain the street tree di diversity. 
Uh, chapter 1520 of the Municipal Code is tree planting and maintenance. Uh, really deals with the maintenance of city-owned trees, conformance to the Street Tree Master Plan, and uh, outlines the process for review for significant prunings and removals along our street trees and in public spaces. And then Chapter 1524, Preservation of Trees. Uh, again, preservation of privately owned but city-regulated trees, so regulates the degree of pruning and removal and front setbacks. Um, in residential and commercial properties, and again, establishes the review process for requests to remove those trees. It does not um, uh, regulate tree planting. Um, so there is a public review and policy making process. A number of boards and commissions are involved in that process. Street Tree Advisory Committee advises staff and of course this commission on uh, requests to remove street trees and front setback trees, um, reviews planting or removal of city trees and changes any changes to the street tree master plan, uh, parks and rec, final decision on many of those. Um, Historic Landmark Commission, Architectural Board of Review weigh in on the review of uh, trees um, um, that are on landscape plans and um, review historic and landmark uh, tree decision making. And then city council would be the final stop. Um, appeals, uh, a final review of ap appeals comes to city council and of course changes to the municipal code. So talking about the plan, um, uh, this is a, a long-term guide for the preservation and enhancement of the urban forest. We figure a 30 to 50 year plan uh, to address cr critical issues such as infrastructure constraints, maintenance and management, community stewardship, uh, and then the city's investment in trees. Um, it builds on this horticultural legacy that we've talked about and ensures that trees support our economic and com community vitality. So we started this process 18 months ago with a case study um, reviewing uh, cities that have also conducted their own urban forest management plan to see what's out there. Uh, we looked at our city policies, general plan policies, municipal codes, and then again we, we um, conducted the tree canopy study. We established a technical advisory committee of which uh, Chair Wiscom, uh, Commissioner Longstreet were uh, a part of, as well as members from the Street Tree Advisory Committee, Planning Commission. We had uh, members from outside of the agency, including Botanical Gardens and Southern California Edison, involved in that as well. We've been coordinating with city departments along the way, community development, fire uh, planning, um, I'm sorry, pub public works. And then we've been out in the community. We've conducted four community meetings, um, conducted a tree survey and been to board and commissions. We figure it'll probably be 20, 20 times by the end of it. Um, identified key issues and then today we are here to present the proposed plan. So a lot of time was spent on identifying the key issues from a variety of perspectives. When we went to the community and said, what are your tree, issue, tree issues and priorities for trees? Uh, we heard loud and proud, you know, increase our tree maintenance. We want to be involved. And there's that need for community, uh, community engagement and involvement and participation in tree planting and decision making. When we went to our boards and commissions, we heard the need that for, for tools to help them assess trees as part of land development review and, we, and a community outreach component there as well. And we went to uh, staff, again, community outreach. We know uh, there's a lack of knowledge on our tree preservation policies. Um, and we also know that coordination of uh, city projects can, can, can be better. So with the help of the Technical Advisory Committee, there's four overarching goals that help guide the plan's development, elevate the importance of the urban forest, continue Santa Barbara's horticultural legacy, promote a vibrant and healthy community, and foster awareness and, pre and appreciation of trees. Um, there's 15 objectives and number of actions. Again, these actions directly reflect back on uh, and address the key issues that we've talked about. Uh, there, the objectives are in three main categories, tree resource management, city organization and policy, and community involvement. And when we talk about tree resource management, we're really talking about what we're doing to the trees themselves, the, the 
better care and maintenance of the trees, the ground that they live in, the actual environment, enhancement of the parkways or the soil that they live in, and then how to strategically plant and maximize uh, those, those environmental and ecological benefits. So up here are the first three objectives, maintain trees to promote safety, health, and longevity. Number two, enhance street parkway conditions. And number three, optimize tree canopy. Some example actions, increasing the tree trimming citywide, again, uh, something we heard from um, the public, revised city infrastructure construction specifications, and expanding our tree planting or emplacement program. Continuing on with tree resource management, optimizing age and species diversity, maximizing benefits of the urban forest, provide urban forest benefits in parks and enhancing native trees. Um, some of the actions that came out of this, partnering with local nursery, nurseries. We've mentioned that tree diversity is at risk if there is no plan to replace the, the onesies and twosies. Um, so why not partner with our local nurseries and other agencies and develop a palette that isn't commercially available but is uh, desirable and, and, and speaks to tree diversity. So that's one of the good actions that came out of this uh, discussions. Tree plans for major corridors. Uh, a lot of the, what the plan is trying to do is be proactive in its approach, and this is one of those actions. We know that places like Upper State Street, De La Vina, Milpas will be, um, will be redeveloped at some point, and we also know that there's a need to get tree, uh, the tree uh, conversation in early in, in redevelopment projects, and this is one of the ways that we can do that, by developing plans and pallets um, for, for areas that would be redeveloped. An increase in canopy cover in parks, parking lots, and other areas. Uh, the plan really comes from a right tree, right place perspective, and this is talking about maximizing the canopy cover and, again, maximizing those economic environmental benefits. <clears throat> um, city organization and policy, two objectives here, enhance city investment of, uh, in health of urban forest, improve interdepartmental communication and and coordination. A lot of what city organization and policy that category is fun focused on is the funding, the coordination within the organization, and those partnerships. Some of our actions include increasing funding for tree maintenance, dedicating funding for community out outreach. No funding line item currently exists, and we know that that's uh, an issue that uh, we need to address, and establishing an urban forest team. This would be a team comprised of uh, staff members from various departments to start that coordination communication. Continuing on with this uh, category, elevating the urban forest objectives and city policies and land development, ensure ordinance support urban forest goals, and improve interagency coordination and partnerships. Um, one of the first actions um, or a priority action is to update the Street Tree Master Plan. As I mentioned, it was um, adopted in 77. It's a plan that has served the city well, but the environment around us has changed. Uh, trees along our streets um, have more infrastructure to deal with, and this is a plan uh, that is in need of an update. Partnerships with Southern California Edison and other agencies. We currently have a partnership with Southern California Edison. What we're talking about is formalizing that partnership, making clear what our goals and intent of this plan are. Uh, we know we have issues with overhead lines um, and how to uh, address those issues. Um, one of the actions includes uh, creating a tree training plan. So young trees planted under power lines can be pruned more frequently so that they're not in, uh, in uh, conflict with the lines above them. And maybe we don't have to do the dramatic tree uh, prunings that we sometimes see today. So community involvement, uh, our primarily community involvement is through the public review process and tree removal. Uh, there are, you know, Arbor Day celebrations and, and active tree plantings, but it is still limited, and, we, and this was one area that we really know needs attention. So three objectives here, enhancing public awareness and appreciation, expanding public participation, and expanding public-private partnerships. Um, we know the public needs to be aware of the benefits of the trees. We know there needs to be education on tree preservation policies and care and maintenance on private property. This can be done through some technical assistance programs and, again, providing uh, participation and more opportunities for um, 
uh, community involvement. Uh, I've mentioned we've been going through the review process with the uh, boards and commissions. You can see our schedule. This commission is one of our last in, in that stop. Uh, and we'll be looking to go to city council in the next few months. Or I'm sorry, yes, next few months, March. That sounded far off for a moment. So when we've, when we've been to our various boards and commissions, um, you know, we'd like to share their comments. So, you know, Family Design Board um, requested that we consider neighborhood com character and compatibility and, of course, coordinate this plan with any other city policies, namely the hedge ordinance that's been going through review. Historic Landmark Commission um, would like to see our, our historic and specimen actions focused into one objective. Um, architectural Board of Review was excited to hear that uh, tools would be developed as part of this plan. That was one of their priorities uh, so that they can help evaluate trees against other resource uh, needs. Street Tree Advisory Committee and uh, the Technical Advisory Committee uh, both had the same priorities of tree maintenance, uh, public education, and tree diversity. And then uh, recently Planning Commission at Planning Commission uh, expressed the, uh, the priorities of outreach, tree and solar design guidance tools, and increased plant, uh, plantings. Um, would also like to see as part of plan edits, including tree benefits and open, open more information on our open space tree trees. Um, with that, we'll take, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so we'd like to hear your comments and thoughts, uh, recommendations. And um, again, we're asking that the commission recommend city council adopt the urban forest management plan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the presentation, Ms. Burgess. I appreciate it. Um, okay, we don't have any public comment on this, so we can open it up to the commission for comments, questions, and eventually we will need a motion for um, uh, hopefully recommendation. Uh, to send to city council. So, does anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Uribe. I do. I have a question. The plan that is in our packet, it's, uh, it, ha it includes a lot more implemented actions than the presentation that was given. So, we're looking to recommend everything that's in the packet and not the summary. That. Chair Wiscom, oh, sorry, were you finished? Yeah, okay. Chair Wiscom, uh, Commissioner Uribe, um, exactly. We don't have the time to spend to give okay. every action. So this is a distilled version of that. Um, we are asking, uh, we, we also know that said, we also know that there are some edits that need to be happening, some cleanup. Um, so we are asking that the commission uh, recommend City Council adopt the plan um, as you see the plan, of course, knowing that there are is some minor edits and cleanup. Again, we also presented the comments from um, other boards and commissions, and that we'll take that in into consideration as well. I also have a question about, um, let's see. Well, bas basically, there is no city ordinance that, or the city ordinance talks about cutting down trees on private property but doesn't talk about planting them and yet in the actions and in the goals there's the idea of planting more trees uh, on private property so is are those guidelines going to be created at some point or is yeah uh, chair Wiscombe and commissioner Reba that's a, that's a great question the 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 plan is largely focused on on publicly owned trees but it also has this element of how can the city work with private landowners to encourage more tree planting, not require tree planting. Uh, it's really, we're looking at it more from a voluntary standpoint uh, and not proposing any uh, policy changes related to that. Thank okay, you. thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Mr. Ferrara? Yeah, I'll go ahead and make some comments here, get it started. Um, one thing I saw here on, uh, in the plan, and I really think is important here, is uh, the di diverse horticultural found in Santa Barbara would not be possible without the winning combination of climate and soils that favor a variety of plant species. 
and Southern California enjoys a Mediterranean climate generally characterized by temperatures and annual precipitation as moderated by cool Pacific Ocean. My concern is climate anomalies and climate changes. We're in a drought situation right now. All our trees, uh, if, if things change, all of this is, isn't going to work. So we really have to look at that carefully. We have also here, I've noticed we have a climate action plan that's part of the Santa Barbara general plan, but we're not talking about it too much here. Part number two in that is plan for adaptation of Santa Barbara climate to changes. Then we go over here and we talk about under tree resource management, one of the bullet points is unknown consequences of climate change on tree population, health, longevity, and maintenance requirements. I'll just mention a couple things here. Uh, another thing we need to, I, I believe, in Objective 8 under city organization policy, we really need to uh, make a greater investment money-wise in, in maintaining our trees, uh, public resources to be able to do that. I think that's real important. We need to have emphasis on that. Interdepartmental uh, coordination, that's uh, something that is absolutely necessary as well as uh, public participation in the urban forest preservation and, and enhancement. And I would, uh, I notice here under implement, implementation plans for community involvement, we're talking about holding an annual public uh, workshop to educate the public on policies, maintenance, and care of trees. I would suggest that we do that quarterly. If we could do that more often, I think that would really be helpful. I like the idea about uh, uh, neighborhood adopt a block or adopt a tree programs. Uh, I think that'll help educate educate the uh, our populace far more on trees. And uh, then we talk about we getting down here. I'm just going to try to go through it quickly here. Our management plan implementation plan is 30 plus uh, year plan. And then we talk about uh, on an organizational and staffing level the first five year actions would include establishing an urban forestry team comprised of several departments to evaluate and address tree management and coordinate land development projects. A couple other bullet points, but I would also add to that that within the first year, we should establish an interdepartmental community climate action plan team and or committee with the power to make and take emergency action citywide uh, whenever necessary to protect the urban forest from service, severe and unanticipated climate anomalies and changes. I think that's something we really look, need to look at because we're in a drought now. We don't know what's going to happen down the road. I'm not saying that climate change is man caused by man or nature. It's just something that happens and we have to be, be ready for it. I'd like us uh, not to be finding ourselves having to be reactive where we could have been more proactive. So that's my only concern and, and addition, and I'd like to suggest we add that in there. That's all I have on it. Great. Thank you very much for that. Anyone else have any comments? Yes, Mr. Heaton. Thank you uh, for the summary presentation and um, all the work put into the plan. Um, it seems pretty comprehensive, and I appreciate that. Um, I have a couple comments, I suppose, just on as we get to looking toward implementation of it. Um, the, we mentioned we'll be partnering with nurseries and trying to um, establish some inventory or ac access to some of those one single species. And um, just would want to make sure that we work on making that available to the community as well, if that's not already part of the plan, um, not just street trees, but community members interested in, in, um, in contributing towards uh, to, towards those plantings um, in their own private properties. Um, I like the idea of integrating uh, edible fruit and nut trees. I know that's probably a maintenance uh, issue in a lot of times, but maybe there's opportunities for partnerships with um, you know, some organizations out there. I know there's Backyard Bounty or other nonprofits that, that would um, work in certain circumstances. Um, so I think that it should be considered at least if possible. Um, and then as we have the, the urban, maybe it's the urban forestry team or other outreach um, and partnership efforts um, with the other utility companies, uh, if we can work on um, 
if there's opportunities to inform and prioritize things like undergrounding utilities, not just um, you know how to, to you know, if we can help identify particular areas if if that if there's ever opportunities to do that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Mr. Reba, did you have an yeah? Yes, I do have one more comment, and in a very early version from uh, March 27, 2013, there was a list of draft uh, objectives and key actions, and one that was really important that was dropped somewhere along the plan was developing a comprehensive budget as part of the city's annual budget process under city organization's objectives, and it's just... It's always important to keep that somewhere within our working within working documents. Just if we forget to have the budget present, uh, all this stuff doesn't get done, or it's harder to prioritize. That, that was my only comment. Great, thank you. Okay, I just I have a couple comments. Um, first of all, I I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Zachary, Ms. Burgess. Mr. Downey, who's here, who, who have really worked hard on this. I think, um, you know, those of us that sat on the technical advisory committee know how much energy and work went into this um, to create this document. Particularly, uh, no, uh, you could notice it in between, the, in between the technical advisory committee meetings. I mean, a tremendous amount of work had been done by staff. So it, it's really great to see, and I... I Truly appreciate that, and I know I speak for all the other commissioners um, who appreciate that too. Um, I love the, um, pair, the the part about the benefits of trees. I think that that is um, underestimated and and often not thought about. We take our trees for granted, but they do really provide health benefits, and there have been studies done that. Um, not only physical health, but mental health, too. And I think it's important to make sure that we emphasize the benefits of, of the trees in the plan. Um, the Technical Advisory Committee spent a long time on the public education and public involvement, community involvement component, and, and really emphasized that. So I would like to see that... Um, you know, really emphasized moving forward, and I think you've done a good job of of um, of really highlighting that in in the plan. I think it's important to to get the public involved, and and it will help um, make a lot of inroads into implementing some of some of the um, the priorities in the plan. And uh, my last comment uh, just relates to budget and dollars, Ms. Um, <laughs> Zachary's smiling over there yeah <laughs> and rolling her eyes no um the um you know we need to um i i um hope that the uh department will um and i hope that the city council will will really take this document to heart and um begin to um uh fund some of the implementation of some of the top priorities. It's wonderful to have a document, but hopefully there's a monetary commitment made to um, moving this document forward and not just putting it on a shelf. And that's, that's so I'm, I'm, I really hope that that's where, where it ends up. Um, and those are my only comments. I, I think um, it's, it's a great, great document. So yes, Ms. Longstreet. Well, I was on the technical advisory committee at the end. I didn't do the heavy lifting that the rest of the committee did. Um, and I appreciate all the work that everyone put into it, from staff to the, the committee members. Um, and I agree with Ms. Wiscom about the dollar amounts. My great concern uh, is our park trees. And I think there, it's a difficult, uh, that's where we have many of our beautiful specimen trees. And they've lived in, you know, they've just lived on their own for many years. So I, I want the city to, under, you know, city council to understand that that's um, really an important aspect to who we are as a city. So, And with that, I'd like to make a recommendation that the Parks and Recreation Commission recommend the Urban Forest Management Plan to city council for adoption. I have a question, actually. Yes, question. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Um, 
how do you guys plan to uh could you could you hold on one sec do we have a, a we can if we second it yeah we, we can we need to second it so will someone second that second. motion okay mr Spear seconds the motion mr rodriguez go ahead um i was wondering how you can get uh youth involved in your plan um uh <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, we, we anticipate that, um, well, first of all, let me step back for a second. One of the things we haven't talked a lot about today is what we already do related to involving the community in the urban forest and tree planting. And through tree planting initiatives, uh, we have involved youth, whether it's on a neighborhood level, if it's part of a neighborhood activity. And then also every year, our staff, working with Santa Barbara Beautiful and local elementary schools do tree planting projects. Uh, one of the things that we would be looking at as part of plan imp implementation is how we work with a school district and look at tree planting on school properties and involving youth that way because then we're actually planting trees in places where the students are with the idea that then it relates to their lives, not just a street somewhere in a neighborhood somewhere. So our plan is to expand that type of effort as part of implementation. Okay, um, and then also, uh, I know you guys are working on outreach. Um, I know a lot of, uh, well, at least San, Mar at San Marcos High School, they offer a horticulture class. And uh, I was uh, kind of a comment, but you can uh, probably make presentations, those classes, just an idea for, for outreach. Great idea. Thank you. It is a great idea. Okay. Very good comments. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I guess that passes unanimously. So, um, okay, great. Thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. So um, we're going to uh, just make a slight change in the agenda here and uh, move item number five up before we take... Um, Agenda item number four. So we are going to the low impact development permeable paver parking lots project review. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Mr. Burgess. This is the Burgess and Burgess team. <laughs> after the Campbells and Campbell. Yeah, after the Campbells and Campbell team. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. I'm here to talk about the recently completed stormwater infiltration demonstration projects. These are the projects at Stevens Park, uh, the Westside Neighborhood Center, the Oak Park Tennis Court parking lot, uh, Oak Park Main parking lot and stage area, and the Oak Park Main picnic area. And these are the projects where the, uh, the asphalt in the parking lots and, and the, the asphalt surfaces was replaced with permeable pavers. So that impermeable asphalt was replaced with a permeable surface. Um, the objective of the project was primarily water quality improvement. Uh, what, what you see is many studies show is that uh, with increases in impermeable surfaces in a watershed uh, is directly correlated to degradation of uh, water quality in streams and habitat uh, degradation. Uh, and so the, the project, <clears throat> in, instead of uh, in an impervious surface like asphalt, instead of the water running, uh, pollutants accumulating on the surface, stormwater uh, washes those pollutants directly through storm drains, even if it's not next to a creek. It goes right to the, st uh, to the creek through storm drains untreated. Uh, the permeable pavers allow that water to soak into the ground where those, tr uh, those pollutants are uh, Treated by uh, treated naturally by microbes in the soil. Uh, um, so basically, we're taking a project and restoring the natural hydrology, and that's the term that basically says putting the water back into the cycle the way it's supposed to go. Uh, and that um, when when it rains on an impermeable surface, you get flashy flows and flooding in creeks, which can damage streamside habitat, uh, erode erode the banks and tree root areas. Um, and when you install this, you restore that hydrology, it soaks into the ground, filters its way slowly to, to the creek, reducing those flashy flows and increasing base flows kind of between rainstorms and dry periods. 
and, and another uh, uh, aspect of this project was that it was a demonstration project. Uh, this project demonstrates how to comply with the city's stormwater management program uh, requirements, and it captures and treats a one-inch storm, one inch, one inch of rain every 24 hours. Um, and so this is done. This is this is a cross section of what what you see underneath the pavers. The the pavers here on top, uh, there the pavers are on top of what you see at the surface. Uh, you, you'll see edge restraints along the pavers. Sometimes this is a curb delineating uh, from a um, a soil area or a tree planter. But these curbs go all the way down to the bottom and create somewhat of a a basin where the water percolates through the the joints in the pavers uh, through the gravel which has no sand in it, so it allows the water to be stored in kind of open void space uh, and, um, and stored until it can soak into the ground uh, and filter through. Uh, this is a, this is, these are just some, uh, it, just to show you during the construction process what this is like. You know, you can see up here uh, the, some of these edge restraints formed, the, native, the, the subgrade right here, and then the rock starting to be piled up right here. This is the Oak Park picnic area. Um, the, the concrete around these tables and barbecue areas was, was redone. This was formed, no rock installed. Here's a spot where you can see kind of the, the basins formed here where the rock hasn't been put in, and kind of a, almost like an open, uh, open tub where that water can filter through. Uh, and then in the bottom right, you can see as the rock is starting to be put in, and then eventually that is brought up to the level where the pavers are put on top there. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through these project plans. I know we've, we've been to the commission before with this project, before we, before we began it. But I'll just go over some of the highlights on these plans. This is Stevens Park. This is the entranceway from Cannon Drive. Uh, the, this area uh, bound by the, the dashed lines is our, where it was permeable pavers, pavers were placed. Uh, this was kept as asphalt, and a little swale was kept to, uh, was put in to uh, capture some of that runoff from, this, from Cannon Drive and this entranceway. Uh, you go all the way back to the back the driveway, and then all the way back here, all permeable pavers. Bicycle parking was placed right there, uh, and this dumpster area was removed because that it's, un, it's not used anymore. Uh, the creek is right along here, up along, along this edge of the park. Uh, this is the West Side Neighborhood Center. Um, this is where the permeable pavers were uh, basically replaced. The asphalt was replaced with permeable pavers here. Uh, this is Victoria Drive, and Pamoo Street is, is over here. This is the Oak Park Tennis Court parking lot, uh, Talent Road, right here. This, this area around here is where you can see where the, where the asphalt, uh, the extent of the asphalt where it was. Uh, this is the area where permeable pavers were placed. Uh, this area was, was left uh, as native soil where it will be mulched and native plants will be planted and also used as parks uh, storage area for some uh, mulch and materials like that. Down here was a place where it was asphalt, where it was completely removed and just used for uh, native soil, so kind of a, an unused old roadway uh, into the German friendship area. This is the uh, Oak Park South, as we call it, and consists of the Oak Park main parking lot, the stage area here, and the Oak Park picnic area. Uh, some elements here that we did was uh, th all this area replaced by permeable pavers. Uh, there's one spot here where uh, the access into the stage area from the parking lot used to be along the creek. This is Mission Creek running through here. Uh, and um, we were able to move this access point over to here in line with this driveway uh, opening into here so that the uh, festival trucks can, can make a straight shot into here and park as they do right there. Um, and then this area can be reclaimed uh, for native vegetation and uh, increased space for, for all these trees right here. Um, uh, concrete pads for the roll-off dumpsters for the festivals were installed right here and over here. Um, and across, this is the footbridge that crosses right here. A new water fountain was put right there. And all of the concrete around these elements, the barbecue pit areas, was increased. And actually what's not shown on these plans and, and what, we, what we decided to do in construction based on input from uh, the tree inspector uh, was we found that um, a lot of the, the roots around these trees were uh, they had a lot of trunk roots and supportive roots. So what we did is we expanded this tree well quite a bit right here, uh, and we made this one as big as these two right here. Um, and there's another tree right here that we kind of uh, gave a little bit more room at a, uh, right at the driveway right there. Um, that's the horseshoe pits right there, stage. 
Um, so to sum it up, essentially the uh, about 100,000 square feet of asphalt was removed. 85,000 square feet of pavers were put in. Uh, the remaining 15,000 square feet was left as uh, uh, native soil, and a lot of that's going to be planted with native plants. Um, and swing gates were installed at Stevens Park and the Oak Park Tennis Court, Oak Park Tennis Court's entrance and that entrance to that mulch area. Picnic tables were uh, replaced at the Oak Park picnic area, uh, and then bicycle parking at Stevens and Oak. And then and we replaced utilities as needed um, and also um, added a conduit to the stage for future uh, electrical needs. So I'll just, uh, before I conclude, I'll just go through some photos before and after just to, just to kind of give you a context on this. And this is Stevens Park. We're looking from Cannon Drive. This is the, the old bollard and chain right there. Uh, this is the new gate that was installed. Uh, and this is the back area. There's actually, so this is the asphalt parking. This is the new pavers. Uh, bike parking is back there. It's hard to see. Um, and then right here, this is the West Side Neighborhood Center, looking out toward Victoria Street right there. Uh, and this is with the pavers installed. This is looking toward Annapamu Street in that back parking lot. And this is with the pavers installed. Uh, this is the Oak Park Tennis Court lot. Um, we're looking from uh, the corner at Talent Road, looking in. And this is where the pavers, you can see the new gate installed. And then over here, you can't really tell but the, uh, the other mulch gate is right there, and you can kind of see it back here in this. Uh, this is that uh, patch of asphalt that was in the entrance to the Friendship area uh, where it was removed um, and then w with native dirt, uh, and then the rest was uh, where permeable pavers were installed. Native plants are installed all along the back here, along the, along the creek, uh, along back here. There's other restoration projects that have been happening back there as well that this will uh, shoehorn with. Um, this is the stage area, looking from kind of standing on the corner of the stage, looking out. You can see what it was uh, and what it is now. It's hard to tell in this picture the condition of the asphalt, but the condition of the asphalt in a lot of these, a lot of these areas was very poor. Um, you can kind of see it here, uh, and um, this is a similar view uh, of, as this one, looking toward the stage um, with the pavers installed. Um, this is that uh, old access road coming in from the side. You can see here where it was where it's all asphalt around that tree. And what we, what we ended up doing was basically, this is that same tree right here. Um, and this is all going to be reclaimed uh, native vegetation. And this is the horseshoe, horseshoe pits, horseshoe uh, area. And you can just see what, what, how, it's, how that's changed um, right there. And this is looking on another side. And this is the Oak, across the bridge, across the footbridge, the Oak Park picnic area. Um, and this is what it is. I took this this morning, actually. And um, uh, these are the new picnic tables. Parks installed new trash cans. Uh, that's the playground in the back there. And these are the, uh, the restrooms and the pump house right over there. Um, and this, is the, this kind of best illustrates what it was with the, with the asphalt. Uh, the asphalt was really poor up here. Um, and this is a similar view. And this is what I was talking about in that, in that, in that plan slide, what we ended up doing. Uh, you can see the space that this uh, old oak had right here. And we ended up ex expanding that quite a bit uh, to give that a little more room to breathe. And then I should add, uh, even, even under these pavers, these pavers allow water to soak into the ground underneath that will provide a lot, uh, um, water for the roots. They also allow that soil to breathe. And um, you know, they're, not, they're permeable to air as well. So you get oxygen going to the roots um, in there. And so this is looking towards the bathroom uh, and a similar view with it newly installed. Um, and so to conclude, the, uh, um, the approximate cost is about $2.2 million. Uh, the Creeks Division received a $1.889 million grant from the State Water Resources Control Board through the Proposition 84 Stormwater Grant Program. Uh, and uh, the remainder of the funds were, were, uh, are coming from the Creeks Division Capital Fund. And so um, I, I, one more thing to add. You, you guys all should have gotten an invitation in the mail. But um, I have some more invitations up here, and I encourage you. We, we'd love to have you at the ribbon cutting on January 29th at 11 o'clock at Oak Park Main Parking Lot. And we'll do a similar demonstration as this with the water truck. Uh, this was, a, this was a, um, a good demonstration here because this is a, park, a portion of asphalt in the West Side Community Center in the back parking lot. Uh, and, and you could really see the It's hard to tell in this picture, actually. But... Uh, the difference in where the water was landing on the pavers just soaked right into the ground, and where the water was landing on the asphalt just uh, 
uh, flowing off and carrying with it all the all the kind of the muck that was on the on the pavement. Um, and so that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Burgess. That was a great presentation. Um, are you going to bring a water truck out to the? You are yes to the opening. Okay, because that's that's always fun to see. Um, I saw it at McKenzie, and it's just a great demonstration of of what these um, pavers are capable of. So, um, anyone on the have questions or comments? For yes, Mr. Casebeer. In the date of that opening again is January 29th, and it's at 11 a.m. It's at the Oak Park main uh, parking lot. Okay. Off, you, you Week from today. All righty. And I'd just like to um, commend the Creeks Division for parlaying their funds, combining them with state grant monies to improve our parks and our creeks and our city. And so um, congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much. And um, Mr. Benson, you've done a great job. Mr. Burgess, you've done a great job. It's, um, it's really nice to see, and it is. It's a joint effort, and I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Escobar, too, who obviously did a lot of work to um, uh, spiff up our parks after the construction was complete, and it, they look great. I'm anxious to get out there. So thank you. Thank you all very great. much. Thank you. Okay, um, we have, um, a, oh, did you have something? Ms. I didn't see you. I'm sorry. Wait one sec, sorry, please. I had, a, I had the thought afterwards. Is there anything like this for public where you would say, hey, to the public, you know, find out why Oak Park was closed for so long? Um, and, or is this, it the, this is, uh, an opening and for the public? Chair Wiscombe uh, and Commissioner Uribe, uh, yes, it is open to the public, um, and uh, anyone's welcome to come. And w we sent out invitations to uh, to a lot of folks, um, and 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 uh, we sent out in the uh, newsletter that we have uh, um, that we send out to a lot of the public. Um, and you know, we're obviously speaking to this public now, so yes, it's uh, we welcome the public to come and 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 see these demonstrations. And, and the key word is demonstration, because the intent of this is to put these types of low-impact development projects in places where people learn what their options are, and it is part of the community outreach program. So um, there will be references to this um, as the city goes forward, and particularly with the Creeks program, talking to the public about how they can really make a difference and incorporate some of these elements into their own private development, private home improvement projects, and also um, for any type of business uh, application as well. So it's getting people thinking about the options that they have and to really make a difference. One more thing I wanted to add is that uh, during the construction, we had interpretive signs explaining the project and, and what was going on. And then we, were, we are going to install permanent interpretive signs um, detailing how the project works and, um, uh, yeah, different elements of the project. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to agenda item number four, which is advisory committee liaison appointments. Um, typically, the commission... Um, each commissioner uh, takes uh, a liaison position and acts as the liaison to the um, to this particular advisory committee, and then reports back once at our regular meetings, like we did. So, um, first of all, I'd just like to go to our um, not our new commissioners, but the the our longer term commissioners, I guess, and ask, is there anyone there that is, is there anyone that wants to give up anything or that uh, doesn't have, has a scheduling conflict that would like to offer it up for um, review? I know. Mr. Ferrara, did you have something? I would just like to say that uh, what the, as liaison where I'm at now, I'm just fine with that, works with my schedule really well, and uh, 
I'm happy with what I have. So you're fine with both Creeks and with IPM? Okay. Uh, let's just go across. Um, Mr. K. Spear? I'm fine. You're fine with where you are, okay. And Ms. Longstreet? Um, yes, I'm fine with where I am. Uh, I think at Front Country Trails is not an active committee at this time, so uh, it isn't particularly time consuming. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm um, fine with what I have. Uh, I would be. Um, Happy to offer the um, the golf advisory committee to anyone that that might might want to g learn more about our municipal golf course. It's a um, great source of revenue. It's also um, it's a pretty vibrant uh, advisory group that that is really into um, it, it, has has done a lot of great things for our golf course. So if anyone, uh, if either of you two want that, you're welcome to it. If not, I'll keep it. It doesn't matter. But we have, um, well, let's see. We, we need someone to get more actively involved on something here. Front Country Trails isn't, well, we have a Neighborhood Advisory Council too. So we have a vacancy on Neighborhood Advisory Council. We have, um, GAC, is there any uh, of you two, are there, is there anything you'd particularly like to do? Maybe that's the way I should have approached this, but that fits your schedule. Yeah, reviewing this, I was actually looking at the Front Country Trail, um, so if that does become active, I'd be happy to be involved in that. Okay. Um, Current situation, that might be a good one just to take right now. <laughs> that's where I'm at. Um, for uh, okay, that's fine. Um, Ms. Uribe? I would be glad to uh, be a liaison to the Neighborhood Advisory Council. Okay. Uh, filling that vacancy. I'll put you down for that then. Um, okay. And um, does anyone want, want Golf Advisory Committee in addition to that? You, you're welcome to be liaison to more than one. And I mean, that's for any commissioner. It's not just for uh, the new ones. Does anyone want GAC? Don't all speak at once. Okay, I'm happy to stay on GAC. So, um, question? Yes. Sorry, this is an annual? No, we'll go through this again um, probably in six months. Yeah, we try to do it a couple times a year because people's schedules change and, um, you know, people like to do different things. So, um, Chair Wiscom, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, and uh, Commissioner Heaton, I can't recall, but do you have a golf background? Do you play? Oh, okay. I, I was going to make a suggestion because it has been very nice for the Golf Advisory Committee. We've had uh, Chair Wiscom and also Commissioner Trenacosti with a golf background, but it had been a long time since we had anyone, a commissioner with a golf background. So what I wanted to propose that perhaps it might, whether it or not it's this time around or in the future, it might be good to maybe do a, a co-liaison so that a, a new commissioner could get introduced and you know mm -hmm. get some background and maybe share meetings. Um, so it's just a suggestion, okay. maybe sometime in the future, um, and and really coming out of a perspective of we haven't had commissioners with golf backgrounds, so as a way to kind of look forward. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also important. I think it's it's also a, a marketing background or a um, you know there there's so much going on at the golf course right now. So I don't know I don't know what your schedule is, uh, Mr. Heaton. But um, would you be interested in being a co liaison on that? Because with Front Country Trails not very active you know it would be nice for you to be on a more active one i don't need the second wednesday of every month at 4:30 um i'm i'm happy to yeah co liaison and i can okay. be more, more involved in the future i have yeah. uh, some schedule constraints in the immediate okay. future so. okay well why don't i put you as a co liaison then for that and um you know when you can make it that that would be great um it would be it, it's a good um it's a good place to really learn about how that part of 
parks works because it's a little bit different entity and um, it has its own unique challenges, uh, shall we say. So, um, okay, so that ends that. Uh, we are done with the agenda and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much.